be in the business to help others win, you know, go out and try to make your customers and your friends and these, and these people that you meet winners, be a servant. If you're a manager, be a servant leader. If you're a salesperson, ser 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 serve the people. Welcome to Outside Sales Talk, where we meet with industry experts to learn the strategies and tactics that make them successful. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and I've helped thousands of salespeople all over the world crush their quota. Today, I'll help you crush yours. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. I have Vince Thompson with me today, and we're going to talk about sales management. So how to build, scale, or reboot a sales organization. Uh, Vince, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Steve. Pleasure to be here. Been enjoying your podcast. Awesome. Well, um, by way of introduction, Vince Thompson led the sales efforts for AOL in the West, Facebook in its early days, and he served as a consultant and advisor to over 40 sales organizations throughout his consulting firm, throughout the, the time with his consulting firm, Middle Shift. He's also worked as a venture-backed CEO, a public company board member, and is the author of a best-selling book on management called Ignited. Um, very cool, events. And, and tell me, how did you move into consulting from, uh, from your, your sales role originally? Uh, for many years when I was working in a, uh, in a full-time, you know, 65 hour a week sales manager job, I I'd kind of thought, wow, you know, consulting, that would be so great to have the freedom of consulting, but I really didn't understand how to do it. And, uh, I really fell into it. You know, after, after I, um, worked at Facebook in the early days, the company's going through lots of changes and the, you know, job wasn't going to be there for me in the future. And, and so I stepped out and I had a lot of opportunity and, uh, I wasn't sure I wanted to jump back in. So what I found was um, that I could take some consulting assignments and I could get a sense of organizations and how they worked and so forth. And at the time I was kind of playing in an, an equity structure where I was waiving some fees for equity and realizing that as a independent um, consultant, I was able to build equity a little bit quicker and more diverse uh, base of startups by consulting. But I, I really fell into it and, uh, I got better at it as I went, as you can imagine. You know, at first, when I stepped into consulting, I thought of consulting as maybe, um, you know, doing the job as I would have done the job as an employee. And soon after, realized how to define a scope and um, a set of objectives that, that worked for everybody. At the same time, give me the freedom to uh, explore other things and, 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 and be most effective for the client at the same time. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah, a uh, big transition in terms of the structure of the relationship and, and how you go about it, how, how you approach it. How, how, did you, how do you know when an engagement is a good fit for you? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a great question because it's the most important thing, right? Um, not, not all engagements work. What I do, and, and when, I, when I stepped out, you know, my experience has been sales management running guiding sales organizations on a day-to-day -day basis. When I became a free agent and uh, companies asked for my help, I decided to focus on the stage in a sales organization's development where they may have a couple of salespeople and they're trying to figure out if they're matching the needs of the market and um, they're trying to figure out how to scale that organization. And in order to do that, they would need um, some technology and they would have a, need a process and they would need to understand how are they creating value for customers and how that works. So I built myself as a revenue consultant, somebody that would go in and um, help build and scale sales organizations. So that business came to me. And uh, what I found was that the type of organizations where I could be effective were, be, were organizations where the leadership was really committed to the success of the sales organization and integrated the customer's voice into the product and into the solution set. And that sounds kind of like an obvious thing, but there are entrepreneurs and there are organizations um, where folks come to it and, and think, uh, geez, we built a great product, hire a person with a Rolodex and they can go out and sell it. And, um, and, and the management doesn't really participate at that level or is less open to feedback. So for me, the, the real defining thing in an engagement is 
do I have an executive team that's willing to go on sales calls, that's willing to talk directly to customers, that's willing to take the feedback from customers and incorporate it into the, in, into the product creation and, um, and, and to stay close to it. If I have that willingness, then uh, we can all work together and we can, we can build a successful revenue operation. If I don't have it, then it's not great. And maybe they need to go through a few more cycles before they're open to the hard work yeah. that has to be done. So you're, you're, you're talking about really pretty small organizations if they're at that stage, right? Because if, if, if you can't do those things, you're, you're in big trouble already out of the gate, right? Yeah, I mean, typically, I work with a lot of startup organizations. So mm -hmm. that's, that's where I really focused. That was, that was the most exciting thing for me. That said, uh, I also work for major media companies, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, I consulted Sony, the CW, Time, Time Inc., uh, and a variety of other larger firms. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that finding that product market fit and figuring out how to how to listen to your customers early on and and uh, produce a product that or a service that that the market really demands and is willing to pay for and then you know kind of figuring out who that ideal customer is and uh, attacking them appropriately and and uh, going after the right market um, is so important and 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 yeah it's. I, I've seen many cases where the the upper management of of a of a startup is more often it's when they're more technical I think and they've built a great product and they've they, they've solved a problem but they they had they don't they don't understand the marketing or the go to market or the 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 uh, they understand product market fit a lot better than they understand going to market and and so that's that that is a really fantastic time to bring in someone like you, I'd say, if, if, well, if, if you're someone who is not in a situation where you, you've kind of figured out how to scale that sales organization, figure out how to, how to grow it. What, what does your process look like when you start working with a sales team? Yeah, typically, um, you know, I come in and I work with management to understand what the objective is. As we mentioned, sometimes I'm working with early stage companies and, and we're trying to bring the task team together for the product market. But when I work with larger organizations, a lot of times the question is, um, how can we be more effective? What's not working? Where are we? And I'll tell you that I find sales organizations really needing to reinvent themselves twice a year in, in, in the competitive markets that we work in. And I, my experience is mostly in media. Sales. And so there's a lot of innovation in media and there's a lot of in combination between technology and creativity. Well, and everybody's and, um, reinventing themselves right now, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it, it's 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 amazing uh, how much the world has changed, and how often it, it it changes. You really start to look at it. You know, this is a larger cycle, but there's just micro cycles all the time. We're in very competitive industries, so um, you know, my my process is as follows, and I and I I I really believe in going and looking at what the plan is and interviewing management and understanding what they believe they're doing and where they're going. And a lot of times what I find in large organizations as well as small organizations is that uh, senior leadership has uh, a revenue plan that looks like a waterfall projection or an Excel sheet up and to the right and some bullet points in a PowerPoint, and here's our objectives, and here's where we're gonna go. And that's considered the revenue plan. And uh, I find that really substandard mm -hmm. because uh, when you really, really dwell down, there's a lot of detail and a lot of granularity that gets overlooked and there's assumptions that are made. So one of the things that I, uh, do with all the companies I work with, and I did it myself as a sales manager, and it was incredibly helpful to me, is I write a narrative sales plan. Uh, it could be a three to 10 page document that basically spells it out. And it says, you know, here's, here's what we are, you know, here, here's what we sell. Here's who we sell it to. Here's why they buy it. Um, here's how we invest our time. Here's our goals and, and the behavior that we're going to take to achieve those goals. Sales is behavior. It's not managing against numbers. And um, I get the team to, to, to participate in that. Usually I have the sales leadership begin by writing this narrative revenue plan, but um, I have them share it with everyone. And what happens when you sit down and write something is you really can't BS yourself. Is, is that really true? Do we really sell it to these people? 
is, is this really the reason they buy it? What was that? Why did the last buyer buy me? And why didn't they buy me again? So it's, it's an amazing forcing mechanism. And what it allows me to do is take the people, their stakeholders in the sales organization, get them on the same page in, in a shared reality, give them a common language, and then use that as a place to build and go forward. Fantastic. And what about as they go forward, um, creating a culture of learning? How do you build learning into a sales organization? Yeah, it's one of the things that uh, I think really defines, uh, you know, flat organizations versus really dynamic sales organizations is the ability to get new information and, and, and have folks participate. So, you know, there's a couple things. What, what I'm looking for is uh, alignment and shared language. And then um, I'm looking for participation and the ability to take the customer's voice and to take new information and, and bring it in. So uh, I typically coach and develop ongoing sales meetings that are topical and give folks assignments and things to bring to the sales meetings, the, the ability to cover your competition, to talk about a new technology, to share a product, and, um, and, 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 and spread that requirement, that knowledge bringing uh, across the organization so everybody can participate in it. So that helps, that helps build the, 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 the learning organization. And um, it continues to keep people in alignment because after I leave, uh, they need to have a process and a system that allows them to continually innovate. You know, so what I'm really doing in so many of these organizations is I'm coaching people into some behaviors that will be, uh, they'll help them be more successful going forward. And, and how, how do you do that? How do you create that alignment within an organization going forward? What, what are the actual steps you take to do that? Well, I, I start out with, um, I start out with getting that revenue plan in place and having folks come to an equal understanding about where the organization currently is. And then uh, I begin to establish meetings where we, where we begin to bring in these learnings and we begin to have a shared responsibility for knowledge. And, and, and we really work to kind of get the customer's voice inside. And we do that by, you know, case studies and analyzing what our customers said and the feedback and what they bought. And, um, I'm not, you know, we don't spend all day doing this, but we spend a couple hours a week and we focus on this rather than drilling the pipeline. So many sales managers spend their time hammering the pipeline and not uh, really talking about the issues that create the pipeline. Um, so I, 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 I mostly focus on, on, on that. And then from there, uh, we look at the successful behaviors to generate revenue, you know, how, how we spend our time. Yeah, it, it, it feels like uh, people get, can get lost in the weeds and, and you're forcing them to zoom out and ask, you know, if, if you're going to write a whole story about your, your revenue plan, you know, the title being revenue plan of, you know, the, of XYZ company and answer questions like, what do we sell? Who do we sell to? Who are our competitors? What is the process? How do we generate leads? How do we, you know, going through each one of these things, you're almost forcing them to really zoom out. And I think, I think a lot of times when an organization goes through a thought process like that, they end up discovering some hole or weak spot or that there is disagreement within the ranks on how something's done, especially the more levels in an organization, the farther away the decision decision makers are from the actual salespeople, and the farther the farther the further away their background is from sales, so they don't understand the salespeople or what they're going through. I think the more you get out, you can very easily get out of alignment with uh, within an organization, which can really cause a wreak a lot of problems, especially as you scale, right? So how yeah how, how have you seen this play out as a company scales as a, as a what have you learned about scaling a sales organization? Well, to, to your point, you know, this granularity is, is and, and having this conversation is really important because it might come to lead, lead gen for sales organization, might be something where senior manager goes, hey, we got some lead gen, we hired some people to do it, or we have a little bit of a system and it works. What oftentimes fails to happen is the important conversation about how do we manage the client's expectation through the lead gen to the seller 
And are we hurting ourselves by bombarding people with emails? Or are we hurting ourselves by brand messages that set us up for failure? And so having some time to bring the salespeople together with the lead gen people, together with the management that all participate in the process and really talk about how that works and how those things work uh, is, 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 really, is really important. So I just wanted to, to, to reiterate that, that part of it. Um, yeah, I, I'm so, kind of envisioning yeah. a, uh, a, I'm envisioning one of those cheesy uh, pictures you see on the wall where like, you know, it's like a black frame and it's got like some word like success at the bottom and you've got everyone, <laughs> everyone in, the, in, in like a, one of those rowboats <laughs> yeah. and like they're playing right. and the, the, those skiffs with like eight paddles and they're all pulling in per, perfect unison. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and I think this, the, getting everyone on the same page and, and pulling the oars together and, you know, from the front line to the management to marketing is so important for, for a, a sales organization's success. What, what else would you say are the key things that you've learned about making a sales organization successful throughout your, your career with, with all these diverse organizations? Yeah. Um, you know, let me, let me circle back, Steve, because I did you a disservice and I didn't really answer your question on scale for a second. Okay. And, and, and what I wanted to say about scale is that scale is about systems. It's about being able to teach what you do to the next person who comes along. Absolutely. And, you know, can you take a sales pitch and can you put it together and can you take a customer uh, questioner survey and can you take those things and, and can you give it to somebody who walks in the door? Can you teach them in a few hours how to go out, talk to a customer and create some value or, or extract some information that'll create some value later? And um, you're not ready to scale until you can do those things. So the, the manager looking to scale needs to go through all of the touch points of the sales process and find ways to be able to teach those in the most effective and efficient way. And then those become the building blocks of scaling an organization and uh, starts with a couple people. So scale is really about systems and it's also about culture. It's about matching the culture that you bring. How do we treat customers? How do we treat people? What are our expectations? And, uh, how do we work with our people? So, and that has never been none of this that you're saying has ever been more true um, in terms of the, the the structure and and think to get scale. We're we're struggling with this right now as we're hiring new people in in a remote world and trying to bring bring a new sales rep, for example, up to speed. Um, you really need those processes to be written down. It all has to be because we. I think when we were all in an office together and, and, and you know, Badger's still remote right now. Um, you know, when, when we were, when we were all in an office together, I think that we were able to lean on the crutch of uh, just sin natural synthesis. You know, it's almost like putting the, right. the our, our new sales reps, it was almost like they were putting the book under their pillow and the, and the, the, you know, <laughs> the, the knowledge was wafting through their pillow at night and, and into their brain, but just by listening to the guys around them and, and you know, the, the people that, uh, the, the people who are already selling the product and they learned how to cover that objection or learn how to deal with this situation or they watched over the shoulder as, as this person gave this demo. Now to scale, we really have to, to bring new people on and get them successful. We really have to have a tight process for every position. And we've seen this as, you know, over the, over the, the past few months be a real challenge that we've had to actually be like, well, wait, how do we do that? Where, how would they learn that? Is that written some, somewhere in creating the materials so that we're able to keep growing and scaling in these in these strange times. Yeah, culture systems are systems are hard because they've got to be pretty specific, and uh, culture is, is is really the most important part. And that's hard to translate when you're working remotely because if you don't get the chance to listen to how a customer service call is handled five, six, ten, twenty times, then you know you begin to uh, try to go down your own road, mm -hmm. and it can feel pretty lonely. So. Well, you, you got a bunch. You, you end up with a bunch of guys reinventing the wheel, right? And that's that's yeah. That's not a good way to to be successful. Which was my which was my original next question. Yeah, was, there you what go. Have, what yeah. have you learned about about success? Um, be in the business to help others win. You know, go out and try to make your customers and your friends and these and these people that you meet winners. Be a servant. If you're a manager, be a servant leader. If you're a salesperson, 
serve, serve, serve the people. I read a book um, years ago uh, that was really helpful to me. It was called Networking with the Affluent. And it was written by Dr. Thomas Stanley, who wrote the book, The Millionaire Next Door. He wrote some interesting things. But this was, this was a, kind of an obscure book that he wrote. And I think it was for financial folks who were working with very wealthy individuals. But the point of his book was, look, people have a lot of problems. They wake up all day long. They, they, they're trying to figure out, you know, how they deal with college applications and, you know, leasing a new place and buying a car and getting their business financing and so forth. If you can understand this and be helpful to people and, you know, do what you say and say what you do, uh, it goes a long way. You know, you, you build a relationship. People are, are, are more willing to uh, share their problems with you, the things that they're looking to solve. And so, you know, I think if you start as a giver and you, you come bearing gifts and, 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 and listen, not, not, not everything's returned. And if, you, if you can give selflessly and don't expect it, then you begin to build a community of people who ultimately you know, there to support you and, and bring you opportunities. So. Yeah, that, that's, that's one of my, uh, as, as for a long time, been one of my philosophies on, on leadership and organizations is that, you know, I, I believe that I'm at the bottom of the organization, not at the top. I, you know, I, I want to be a yeah. servant leader. I, I believe that I exist to serve the organization and the people in the organization and help them succeed as opposed to the other way around. Uh, and uh, I think that's a really, that's not, especially in like a large corporate environment, I think that's a hard mindset to put yourself into. But if you, if, if you can do that, that, I think that's how the best leaders actually, actually, uh, actually accomplish great things. It's through enabling the people that are reporting to them, quote unquote, but by, by making them better, by, by focusing on, on, on serving them, removing barriers for them, taking away obstacles. And this is particularly yeah. true in, in sales. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. Um, so when you work with the people in a sales organization specifically, what are your goals? What, where do you wanna end up with a client? Obviously, I want my clients to be successful and to arrive at a, a much better place than they were before they met me. And, and I want to leave them with uh, some systems and some tools and some, some thoughts. And, and, and I want to affect their culture. Uh, the exciting part for me, and I, I think of myself as a creative executive um, and somebody who expands opportunity, uh, is that I, I, I hope to bring them to a, maybe a bigger vision than they had of themselves or a pretty grand vision. One of the things I like to do when I talk to sales management, salespeople together, to say, let's forget about our product and let's forget about what we have. Let's instead think about what's the most exciting story we could tell a client, the kind of story, the kind of solution, the kind of opportunity that would get them to jump out of their chair and give us a hug what would they be absolutely thrilled to hear? And then let's, let's talk about what that is. And then let's step back and let's think of if we can make it, if we can make it true. Can we, can we put the product behind it? Can we put a solution behind it? Can we make that true? And if we start there with delighting a customer, exciting a customer, um, sometimes that conversation and that exercise brings us to some really interesting thinking and, and, helps us be honest about what we are and what we are currently delivering and, and maybe setting a flag as to where we want to go. So I really enjoy that. And what, what are some, some tips and tricks that you have for specifically outside sales leaders who want to create a high performance and a growth based sales culture? Uh, well, first of all, the, you are, you get the culture that you are. So you have to walk the talk and live the life and be what you expect people to be as a sales leader. Um, all of that said, if you want a real high performance culture that grows, that has this learning mechanism built in, uh, you need diversity. You need diversity and, and you need diversity that's, you know, demographic diversity, you need psychographic diversity and you need experience diversity. And bringing people who have worked in other industries into your industry, 
uh, is really exciting. They bring all kinds of interesting ideas, bringing people from different economic backgrounds, uh, racial backgrounds. These things are all really important in, in, in creating new ideas and new thought and, and challenging people. And an organization where you know, people can openly share these ideas and challenge assumptions, um, we know these, are success these tend to be more successful and more positive. But the, the, the leader has to create that environment, has to create a safe space, has to truly believe and back and stand behind these people, and has to empower people and, 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 and create the opportunities for this exchange. That and a great comp plan <laughs> can go a long way. Right? You got to give people incentives, but well, give them it, incentives and give them the tools. And um, well, for, first of all, I uh, I could not agree more uh, that uh, about bringing in diverse groups of people to to your organization, diverse backgrounds and types of people. And uh, we, at Badger, we've hired a bunch of people from other countries like Europe. We've got a bunch of like European Badger just because we have an, an office there. But now they've kind of We've shuffled all these offices together. A bunch of Americans have gone to the European offices, and Europeans have gone to the American offices. And I, and I think that's really that those diverse perspectives and really different ways of approaching things um, has been really helpful to us. And I, one thing that I would add to what you said that I don't think a lot of companies think about is um, educational background diversity. Uh, I think that you know, especially in the Silicon Valley, I see. A, uh, but but really everywhere. I mean, I, I see people really are biased towards hiring, you know, college grads from the same 10% of schools. And yeah, um, I, I think that because everyone really is going after that, you know, so let's just say half people go to college and then of that half, everybody's going off to, after the same 10%. It's like everyone's trying to hire the same, what is that, 5% of the available work, workforce? that the, the competition for that 5%, and a lot of people just have like some random, you know, uh, when I was at Google, it was like this, you know, the, they said they have a random uh, requirement, like, oh, and by the way, they had to go to like a, a top 20 school. And you're like, well, I mean, you just shrunk the world down to like 1% of the applicant pool with that one little requirement. Um, right. It's like, you know, someone who's who's uh, dating and it's like, yeah, I'll date anybody, but I do want them to be at least six, five, six, five would be perfect. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think, I, I think that's, a, that's something that really holds people back in their, in, in their hiring and keeps them from hiring a lot of great candidates. I think there are, you know, a lot of great, uh, amazing, especially in the sales role, your educational background and how successful you were in school is not necessarily highly correlated to the skills and abilities that, that are, are needed for the job. There are some correlations, but it's not, it's not as, uh, you know, be, if you wanted to become an academic professor, the correlation to academic success is extremely high. Mm -hmm. Sales is the right. opposite, I would say. Uh, but you really see a lot of people still biased on that. I think there are a ton of people that didn't go to college who would make an outstanding salesperson, even of things that are really complex, like an airplane engine, you know, something that's super, super difficult to, super complex thing, you know, someone who didn't go to college could still actually sell that. And certainly didn't, you know, people that didn't go to the top 20 colleges that everyone goes after. I think there's a huge opportunity there to expand your hiring pie that people don't think of. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's a really, really good point. Yeah. There's some, you know, obviously people who, uh, who do well and go to those top colleges spend a lot of time on academics and they don't have as much time actually go work and have work experiences so yeah well I mean, nature there and, and i'm a great example of that right like i mean yeah. they, they when i was at business school at stanford we weren't even allowed to have a job i mean you could i, I think you know if you petitioned you could have like a short internship or something you could work during the summer but like they really you you know they and certainly what made me successful, I can say without a doubt, like the, you know, going, having that educational background has been very useful for very many things. Um, but I would not say that it was necessary at all for, for my success as a salesperson back when that was my job. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that, that it definitely was not, you know, it, that, that was not the reason that, that, um, that, that I was able to just be a good salesperson. Right. And I, and I think a lot of people, that if 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 you're telling your recruiters yes, and we want someone who's an 
top from a top 50 school or whatever you're telling them if you just remove that one requirement from your hiring process you may be really surprised at, at, at the quality of the candidates that you get how it's going to pop yeah yeah another thing you just brought up there um a second ago that i wanted to dig into you you, you brought up you said uh you, we're, we're talking about high performance culture and, and and then you said and a and a great comp plan could you could you Tell me a little bit about what you think a great comp plan looks like. Um, well, a, a great comp plan, and, and, and comp plans, I, I believe they're a high art, you know. I, I, they're never perfect, and you work hard to design these things. But a great comp plan is a comp plan that has a seller get pretty excited about their opportunity and their ability to, to, to make money and, uh, and to be successful. So that's great. Comp plans need to incent uh, appropriate behavior. Uh, you, you can have a comp plan and say, hey, we'll give you a 90% commission. And you know, your salespeople are out there slamming the prospect's head into the desk to get up and sign the paper. Like, what? <laughs> this is not what we meant. You know, um, you, need a, you need a comp plan that rewards the behaviors that you as a culture and an organization believe in and that create uh, meaningful value for your customers. And um, a lot of that you know, starts with who are you as an organization? What are you looking to achieve? What are your goals? What do you want your customers to say about you? And then how do you, how do you put your sellers in the best position to create extraordinary value and long lasting value? You know, Peter Drucker says the purpose of a company is to create and keep a customer. And, and you know, too many comp plans are good at creating customers, but not really keeping them. So there's, there's ways to, to, to design it around what you truly believe in. And uh, those are yeah. the, I think those are good comp plans, you know, and, and I, comp plans, uh, you, 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 you talk about the, with the organization, you get the organization to understand what the goals are. You get the organization to understand the reason why you behave the ways you do. And then you design the comp plan to be in alignment with that. A lot of companies, have uh, platitudes and cultural things that they say, and then comp plans that live over here and a, a hard driving um, sales management style that really throws these things out at the end of the day. So, you know, there's gotta be some authenticity and, and comp plans need to have buy-in before you can really roll them out, you know, so. Yeah, I think you said something really important though that jumps out at me. Um, the the align the, the comp plan needs to be in alignment and um you know and i think we're in we're in a strange time right now i mean I, yeah for for reference it's uh yeah. june 30th 2020 if you're if you're listening to this in two <laughs> years time capsuling then, uh, <laughs> then we're, we're in the middle of the beer, uh, the beers will be gone we'll be yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you're still alive in 2022 um you know it's it, i think that uh we, the alignment thing is really important and this is a weird time, right? Like the, this is, when you need to re, this is a great time to revisit your comp plan and make sure that it's an alignment because a lot of people's margins are compressing and um, in, in this economic time. And if you have a product with tight margins um, or, if, or if you just need to defend your margins, you, you're, you're, if your reps are currently comped on revenue, you may have a problem. And a lot of comp plans are comping on revenue when the margins have just massively compressed. And I think it's a great time for people to, it's a major switch, but to change from comping on revenue to, to pro, comping on profit margin the way they commonly do in, in thinner margin industries. So you may have been a thick margin industry or relatively thick six months ago. And today you're, you're a thin margin industry. You may want to revisit that you know, and, and, and just to, to, you know, I don't know if what I'm saying is making sense totally, but if you, you know, if your profit margins are 30% and you give a 15% discount to win the business and, and now you, your margins only 15%, you actually need two deals to be, to get the value, the profit out of, that you were getting yeah. out of one deal at full price. So if your rep is, the comp plan is comped on revenue, them giving that 15% discount only costs them 15% of their commission. If their comp plan is, is based on profit, that 15% discount they just gave away just costs them half their commission. So 
you can get them to defend the margins better if you align the comp plan with the bottom line instead of instead of the top yeah, line. Yeah, I you know I understand the need for that, and um, let me this the way I feel about margin is that the margin responsibility is really the responsibility of sales management, and and shouldn't be in the hands of the individual seller because I want my sellers to be advocates for their clients 24 seven. And I never want to put a seller in a situation where they feel like they need to negotiate against a client for their own personal benefit. So, um, so, so I understand that, but I think the margin part we put, the, we, we put with the sales manager and we allow the seller to, to work uh, without without any conflict i think in some industries they handle it a little bit better but um yeah well that that's certainly yeah. the way we do it in software yeah. or um other high margin industries but if you're if you're selling you know corn at a six percent margin you are for sure paying your reps on profit not um not right not not revenue so but it, you know in the startup world and you know obviously the startup, startup world is dominated by technology right now in this at this point in history but they um for revenue is almost always the way it's done but i i wouldn't be shocked if there's a lot of companies out there and, and, and the listeners of this, of this podcast are, are, are not just in, in software or yep. it's, it's a very broad swath of, of field sales people. So a lot of them are in a lot of field sales roles do sell tighter margin products. You know, they, they sell sure. products you can touch and feel as opposed to, to air like, like software companies sell, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, so they, so I, but you know, maybe they had a 30% margin, but today it's really, it's cranked down because they're, they've got a desperate competitor who is liquidating their inventory for, for very little money because they're just trying to stay afloat and get through these crazy right. times. Right. Right. So if, if you're up against that, you're, you know, it's going to compress your margins. So it's a, it's a, it's a time yeah. of a lot of, you got to rethink a lot of things right now. And I think comp well, plan some is, of the is other, one of them. Yeah, some of the other things that I like to do in a, in, a in, a, in a comp plan are to incent some behaviors. So some of your comp plan might be towards a target, like there's a base salary, the ability to double your base salary over the course of the year hitting some targets. Some of those targets may be economic targets, but some of them might be behavioral targets. Like we're going through a pandemic, uh, how many, what percentage of your customers can you retain? The people who, uh, and their account lists, retain the majority of customers in a billing relationship mm -hmm. may get some incentive or some override. Um, other things that sometimes aren't entirely tied to economics, but we know as good managers are important for the future of our business. Um, so some of those things are kind of fun to experiment with as well. Now, they're harder for me to sell into senior management, to be honest, because uh, there, some of those things are a little softer and, and uh, it depends. But but I do I do think that those things, for, for just one last thing, when, when somebody starts in a company, instead of giving them a number, sometimes in the first quarter or two, I actually just want to give them a behavior. N number of sales calls, information, briefs on the customer's needs back into the company, and also during that time period, um, you know, uh, uh, some other objectives, maybe a, a couple of numbers of signed deals or something but less based on economics so that the person can have success without having to go, just go kill a number. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I could not agree with you more, it, 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 especially with respect to an, a rep starting, as you mentioned, I think you're, you're often best off going with behavioral goals. So, you know, the phone calls that you're tracking, the number of, um, proposals created, the number of presentations done. I think that's, really relevant to, to kind of yardstick a rep early on after you know the first four months you've hired them if if you make that a long-term measurement and i would say almost if you, if you make anything other than revenue or profit the major thing that a rep's comp plan is based on on the longer term you can get some skewy behavior because you're if you're comping if you just if your comp plan is half weighted on number of proposals um, put out there right you're going to get a lot more proposals that won't necessarily lead to revenue so i think you want to you want to align the comp plan with the, with the behavior that the business needs out of the out of the sales team so if the business needs revenue and you're you know a growth mode software company then 
based on revenue. If you're a, if you've got your profit margins falling and your your factory is hardly profitable and you're making widgets, then maybe it, maybe you're much better off going to going to profit. Um, yeah. you, you 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 said something really interesting there that I thought was important. Um, what was it? Oh, the 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 re- revenue retention and how you want to focus on that in, in in these times. And I think one thing that people I think that's super important. And you know, keeping the streams of income and the customers you have is is, is really worth focusing. And and in general, I would say companies don't focus on this enough. Um, but one thing that you can look to do in these times is um, break up your your sales team. And I, and I would actually always recommend this, but if you haven't done this, it, this is a great time. You can break your sales team up into the hunters and the farmers and the lead generators. Um, and this is something that's pretty commonplace, I would say, in the software industry, but I, I don't see a lot of, I don't see it being implemented nearly as much in a lot of more traditional industries. But basically, if you had 10 guys in the sales team, you'd want these three to be generating leads, or maybe it's just these two, maybe it's four. It kind of depends on your pipeline and how, where the challenges are. But maybe these three, let's just say for the sake of argument, into generating leads and they never close a deal. If they get their job is to find new leads and find new new interest, pipeline, top of, top of funnel. When they get someone, they pass it to the person in the closing role. Maybe you have these four people in the closing role and they're in charge of taking this live lead and taking it to close. Once it's closed and, and, and is starting to get implemented or is starting to get used, and then, then it switches off to, a, to the, the hunter, or I'm sorry, the farmer person, the, what I call, well, what in, in software we call the, the customer success associate or customer success manager. But their goal is, to, is retention, upsells, making the customer happy, and that's all they do. They don't have a sales number. They have a retention number. They have an upsell number. They have you know, all these processes in place and they're able to focus on customer retention and happiness. And that, that's, that can be a, if, especially if people have extra bandwidth and you can take a, a bump in kind of your sales processes right now, th- this is a strange economic time and this can be a good time to, to look at making, executing a breakup like that. Yeah, I think it's great. I've, I've always had sales organizations designed and working in, in that manner. And, uh, it's really important to understand who fits where. It really is a personality characteristic in a way that people like to work, and uh, they're all important. Um, yeah, and the but, focus makes them get more done, right? Like this person absolutely. that was always best at, at kind of generating leads and always had a huge funnel, make them in charge of the funnel for all three of these people. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah. this person that was great with existing customers and really understands the technology or, or uh, understands the product or service and can, can really has a great bedside manner make them permanently in charge of your customers. And this, this woman who's just a killer and, you know, can knock down, hunt down a deal and close it and has, you know, is great at pushing the herding the cats and pushing the deal down the line, make them the closing account executive, make them in charge of the actual deal. So, yeah. um, I think by, by that focus, you can get some great, you can get more out of an entire sales team. Yeah. Agreed. Um, so, um, what would you say, and I love the wisdom you're dropping on us here. What, were there any big ahas from your career that you'd like to share with our listeners? Uh, you know, aha moments that changed your career path, your life, learning. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 do, I do have some. Uh, it's very interesting. I, you know, I think that I've had, very fortunate, I've had just a really terrific and blessed career and uh, and I think back there, there were some pivotal things that happened. And, and oftentimes my career was shaped by watching other people do things. I didn't know these jobs existed. And I saw somebody doing something kind of cool and I, and I wanted to do it. But if I think back um, with my sales career, there were some really cool things that, that happened uh, very early. I'll tell you, I'm going to tell you three stories. I'll try to be succinct with each of them. Very early, I was selling television advertising in the Monterey Salinas market. I was probably three months into my sales career. I went to go call on a guy who had a roadside nursery in Salinas called Graber Gardens. I walked out. I was a little nervous. I went in. I found the guy in the back of his nursery. He's moving some plants around. I said, Mr. Graber, my name is Vince Thompson. I'm with KCCN TV. We, we're a television station. We can bring sight, sound, visualization, show people your brand. So many customers in the Central Valley. I'd love to hear about your. So I went through my pitch. 
And the guy looked at me and said, not interested. And that was kind of it. And I realized, oh God, this, this did not go well. So I started walking back to my car and I got I, mostly across the nursery and he yelled out, hey, what? Said, yeah, yeah, it's you, come back here. So I went, oh my gosh, maybe he's interested. So I went back across and I got over, back over to him. I go, yes? He goes, you forgot to ask me if I had any co-op dollars. I said, oh, do you have any co-op dollars? He said, no, I just didn't want you to come back asking later. <laughs> and I realized in that moment that I was working in an industry where we all had the same pitch, that I was no different than any other seller who'd come from the radio stations to the television stations, and that they all ended their pitch asking if he had access to money from manufacturers that would help pay for the campaign, the co-op dollars. It was really embarrassing, you know, and, and I left that and I realized that that's not what I wanted to be not uh, somebody who was just like everybody else and brought no distinguishable value. So in, in that time I learned that, look, I really needed to find a way to differentiate. I needed to go in and help that person. He, this guy's trying to grow his business. He's trying to get new customers. What kind of knowledge can I bring? Can I bring him an article? Can I find something from the National Association of Nursery Owners that talks about a coming trend? Can I, can I pull something out so that when I stop by this place next time, this guy was actually happy to see me. And, and I'd done something for him and I'd increased his business or brought value to him. So it just made me realize, bring value first. Uh, and that's big change. You know, I was here in local, I was in local television. I'd worked in two markets. I was excited about the internet business. In 1998, I got to San Francisco. I got south of market, down the street from Wired Magazine. About the same time Wired was putting up banners. I worked at a website called Third Age Media, a really neat company for amazing women, Mary Furlong. We were putting up banners. And uh, my boss and I, we just had to call down the street to Wired. Like, what's the size of that thing you put up? And it was an exciting time. And, and so I wrote an article. And my article was called, uh, it's a, I think it, I wrote it for Television Week. It was a guest editorial. I sent it in. And, 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 and I said, now is an exciting time to be in interactive media. And I said, if you're a seller who works in the spot and dot culture of ratings and make goods, this is really cool. You know, you, we, here we go talk to clients directly. They're very interested in interactive media. It's a great time. So I wrote the article. Um, unbeknownst to me, uh, a guy named Charlie Warner, who's a great mentor and friend of mine, was consulting back at the time the folks at um, AOL. And he was in the top executive suite working for Bob Pittman, who he had mentored for many years. And they were looking for somebody to sell ads out on the West Coast. And so he read my article and said, well, geez, this is interesting. Here's a guy who came into television business and he's super excited about interactive media. He's in San Francisco and we're looking for someone. So I went and, and I got that job. They hired me to run the West. And I'd gone from a TV guy, you know, and, and working at this website in San Francisco to a job where I was making um, more than twice what I'd been making before. It's like super exciting. And so the lesson there was just, I got out in my industry, I shared some information, I did it because I was excited because I knew there was other TV guys that were probably sitting around looking for something more exciting to do at the time. And it came back to me in a big way. So, you know, differentiation, bring value, find a way to contribute to your industry and get some visibility. And then the third thing um, is when I took that job, and, and you know, it's very lucky, I, I lived on... Uh, I lived on my base salary and I saved my bonuses because I, it was an opportunity and I, and I thought, well, geez, if I, if I can get some money and I can bank some money and, you know, pay off some loans and get ahead, I'm going to uh, have more freedom and more opportunity. And so I spent seven years at AOL. And when I came out of AOL, it was the earliest days of Facebook. Facebook, I think, had about 25 employees and they were looking for their first VP of national sales. They had a college team. They're looking for them to run national sales. And, you know, I, I, they reached out to me. I interviewed for that job. Uh, they said that they'd talked to something like 17 different VPs of sales. They offered me the job. I, and I felt like, wow, this is amazing. I've got to be the best candidate in the country. But what I really realized later was I got that job because I was the only person in the country who could afford to work on that salary. <laughs> it was like a startup. It was like a startup salary, right? And and it was a fraction of what I was making at the time. 
and all the other big VPs that they hired to go in and do that job, they were living a bigger life. You know, they had mm -hmm. big expensive mortgages and a bigger life, and it was still a risky thing to do back at that time to, to join Facebook in those days. Um, but I was able sure. to do it because I had some cash in the bank and some flexibility. So I think that's a, I tell a lot of young sellers, if you're going to work, you know, in an equity driven business and you're going to take risks and work for startups, then it's a great idea to, to, to get, live, the, live below your means and have the ability to do it economically. Yeah, I was able to do something similar uh, during my sales career. I was able to save a bunch of money, and that allowed me to 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 make you know to start this software good. company and and not pay myself for six years. <laughs> so, you know, that that uh, which wasn't it wasn't the plan necessarily, but it, it ended up happening. But because uh, you know, every time it's it, winning. But every time it came time to pay myself, I was like, oh, I'd really like to hire one more person to do this, or oh, I could really use an engineer with expertise in that. How about I just, how about I just don't pay myself again this year? But, oh. um, but that, the only reason I was able to do that was, um, was that savings and Amazon, because I had invested, yeah, I invested some money in Amazon, and that, that just was like a little cash Yay. machine for me. I just kept selling. So selling 20 grand a shares at a time and I could live on that. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I had a lot of friends. I know a lot of people in, in contacts, you know, who, who they, 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 they can't start a company or they can't take a big risk because, you know, they, they already, they have, you know, three kids and a mortgage and just, it makes it, maybe they, maybe it's not that they couldn't, but it just makes it a lot harder. Um, if, if you're yeah. in that kind of situation for sure. Well, it's not lost on me that, you know, I've benefited from white privilege and all kinds of other benefits that were built in that put me along. And I think at a time like now, you know, we have to realize that, yeah, there's a lot of people living beyond their means, but there's a lot of people who never got the chance to kind of dig out and get into those, those opportunities too. And to the extent that we can help them through our, our time in startups and, you know, our own creativity to, to help put those people in those winning shots because we do we you know like we've been talking about we need we need the diversity to get to get the big ideas and we get the big wins so yeah absolutely. fun to think about the future yeah well i'd love to move into our next section of the of the discussion sales in 60 seconds so quick questions quick answers uh first okay. question what is the one thing that a lot of sales managers don't do enough of or neglect but should focus more on to become successful leaders? Pull each seller aside, spend a half an hour to an hour, take a sales challenge, go granular, break down all of the issues. Ask, ask the five whys. If you haven't heard the five whys, Google it. Get into the five whys. And, and then as the sales manager, Take the, play, take, take the workload off, go do the work, be the assistant, go hammer the, the problems, go fix it, go solve it. Let that seller get forward. I think of my sellers as um, hurdlers in a hurdling race and they've got, you know, there's eight of them and they've got 15 hurdles to kind of go through. And each one of those is part of the sales process and they're, you know, knocking down these things they need help. And so if you get in there and you're trying to remove this barrier and work on this thing, you can help you get these people success. They need, they need help. They don't need somebody to tell them what to do. They need somebody to help discover and uncover the problems and simplify the process to resolution. I love a good metaphor. And that's a great one. A sales team as hurdlers. That that's, that's okay. very visual. I love it. Um, what, what can a sales manager do this week to improve their sales team's performance? Well, I, I, again, I think it's commit to clearing, commit to clearing the hurdles and really deliver on them. A lot, a lot of times sales managers kind of get trapped between upper management or other departments and then the salespeople. And so they acknowledge the problem, but they don't get the problem solved. And clearly they can't solve all the problems, but you know, if, if you want to do something big this week, work on a problem that's in the way of your sellers and get to some resolution. Do you have any favorite tools and, and, and Badger Maps doesn't count? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Badger Maps is awesome in terms of the ability to be more effective and, and, and spend time on the things that matter, you know, and, and any tool that will help you in terms of productivity and get you 
more focused on solving a customer's needs is incredible. And, and, there's, and there's, there's a lot of tools that are coming. In terms of tech tools, I go back to consulting tools. I, I really, you know, I talked about that narrative business plan. That is uh, like the holy grail for me in terms of sales. It's, it's revisiting those things on a regular basis and going back and looking at that narrative form. And I know you probably know about the Amazon culture, but Amazon's yeah. big on narrative as well. And that's uh, exactly what I was thinking of when you were saying that. And I've never actually heard someone give that advice for a sales organization. I absolutely love it. But that's the, the first thing that came to mind was Bezos. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. And uh, I was excited to see that they use it and how they use it. You know, there's something else about their culture that I really like uh, is that, that they have a debate and it can be a pretty raucous debate, but when they commit, uh, I, I thoroughly disagree with you and I'm absolutely committed. Let's go do this. Yeah. I love um, it. I think it's, I think it's brilliant. You know, there's no looking back. We got here, we made the decision. I'm going to support you. We're going to go try to make this thing happen. That's important. You know, yeah. this is where culture really eats strategy for lunch. And, and when you see these really successful companies like Google, where you came from, right? The, 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 the culture, the culture is the success. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That, that, uh, there've been several times, um, looking back on my career where, where, uh, I, I wish I knew about that advice from, from Jeff I, or, or I wish I could think of it in the moment and at the time where it's like, okay, we agree, but we've got to pick and we've got to all support the direction that we're going to go because there are two directions here and, and doesn't appear that we can look at the data or come up with a, come up with a, to a perfect decision because we just don't know where there's a lot of unknown unknowns here, but this is the direction we're going to go and we got to all be on board. Um, and yeah. even though there's some dissent in the ranks here, there, there, I, I didn't say the last part. <laughs> there have been several times where I've just chosen, okay, you know, we don't know what, you, what to do, but this is, this is what my gut is and that's what we're going to do. But I, I, I wish I had said, said the Bezos part next, but it didn't, it didn't come to mind at the time. <laughs> um, how do you stay up to date uh, in the field of sales? Do you have any favorite resources that you follow to keep sharpening uh, your sword? In, from time to time, I check in on sales, you know, sales material, things that are being written, uh, books that are being written. Um, but to be honest, uh, I usually go right to the customer. And so I ask the customers, what are you buying? Why are you buying? Who are you buying it from? What's interesting lately? How did you get prospected in a way that turned it into uh, uh, you willing to take a meeting? How does anybody find out about your needs? These things change. And um, so when I'm starting to take on an assignment, I'm, I'm drilling into something or maybe a company I'm investing in and I'm trying to help, I really go to the customer base and, and I listen to them. I'm, I'm cheating a little bit, obviously, but my, my latest trick is uh, when, I, when I hear about someone that wrote a great book like Ignited like you did, I just invite them <laughs> on my show and that's how I stay uh, up to date on, on it's, it's, it's brilliant. Yeah, you know, you're, 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 you're in class as a student and a teacher every time. <laughs> I, I, and it's good I'm to most, teach. I'm I'm 98% student. Uh, I don't I don't that's that, that's I don't do a lot I don't do a whole lot of teaching. I'm I'm mostly on the learning end myself. But you're, uh, you're teaching you're teaching me. We're all teaching. <laughs> We're all, it's important. Yeah, but that's that's a that's a, a fun way to learn. I've found is just is bring, you know have have conversations like these. Yeah. Um. Well, if you had to say, what is the greatest sales lesson that you've learned over the years? Oh, I. You know, I think just at the bottom line is just, just be great, you know, do what you say you're going to do, communicate honestly with people and, uh, and, and try your best, you know, try, try your best and be great. Realize everybody's an opportunity. It's, you know, I've, I've had a pretty long sales career and it's, and it's blossomed from, you know, being a salesperson to being a sales manager to being an executive and a consultant and an investor in these companies. And I kind of played all these roles over the years. What really blows me away is that if you're, if you're really good to people and you try your best, people will remember you many years later. And, and you know, it's, I was just thinking back, I have a client that I called on 20, 20, over 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, now he's a major executive at a massive media holding company. 
And, uh, you know, he, he sent me to one of his most senior executives and said, hey, Vince is the guy you need to talk to about this. this he, he will help you. This is the person. And I haven't even talked to this guy for four or five years, you know? And um, how does he know I'm the guy? I could see who knows what I could be doing now. <laughs> I could be homeless. Um, Unlikely but, if you were uh, the first, uh, first national sales manager at Facebook that you end up homeless. That'd be but tough. Uh, you never know. You never know. You never know. <laughs> that'd, but that'd, uh, be one, that'd be one hell of a Coke problem. That'd be well, problem. listen, I was there. I was there for a short period of time. My window was very short. Very, very short there. I stayed for a cup of coffee. But it was a it was a good <laughs> cup of coffee and it was a great time. It was a great time to be there. But yeah, I think that's, you know, to answer your question, I think it's, I think it's just, I think it's that simple. I think it's that simple. I think it's, you know, just, just try to be great, do what you say you're going to do. And you'll be amazed years later uh, that you continue to benefit from, from things that will be very surprising to you. It's delightful. Absolutely. Fantastic advice. And as an actionable, ta actionable takeaway, um, what should the sales leaders listening today do as a first step, especially in these crazy times, to get started on scaling their sales organization and and uh, and and being successful in this new world that we're in? Well, if they're looking to scale their sales organization, um, write it down. Write down your current process, and then try to teach it to your kid or teach it to your wife or, you know, your husband, somebody who doesn't understand your industry. And if you can do that, you've begun to be able to get the bolts inside the scale, but you, you can't, in order to scale, you need to take something that feels very familiar to you and you may have a lot of assumptions about and bring somebody in who knows nothing about it and, and show them how, how to do it. So uh, break it down. Uh, write a little paragraph tutorial, try to be simple, catch yourself. Um, you can do these things for an hour a week. You can put an hour on your calendar every week as a sales manager and say, look, I know I'm going to scale this thing. I'm at two people today. Let me take a look at a process every week and let me think about how this works. And uh, let's, let's take our email flow from our lead gen and let's take the copy and let's put it together. And uh, let's see if we think that that's successful having customers. Oh, by the way, when I went to go look at that, you know, it dawned on me, we're not really A-B testing copy since we did this thing. Oh, that's been six months ago. Well, that's kind of lame. The world's changed. Maybe we should be A-B testing copy. So all these things bring you closer to what your cycle is and, and, and your process. So Yeah, we should always be A-B testing copy, especially right now. I mean, there's there's some key messages that, that uh, I think – Almost everyone's go-to-market needs to needs to have changed at least a little bit in in these times because uh, you know the 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 what's going to resonate with with your uh, with people um, with, with these uh, with with, the, with people that are your customers is is a little bit different I think you know the, the yeah. way, what what they need to hear in terms of uh, in in terms of what's going to help them what's going to make them engage with you is, is different. You know, the, I, one, one thing that I just did that, that I found really valuable. I just did it with my sales team um, is, is change our messaging from we'll help you do better. So, you know, like the, you know, uh, it, well, in our case, it was, we'll help you sell 20% more with your field sales team. So we changed from we'll help you do better to we'll help you do more with less. And, right. uh, right. and, and you know, so for, for me, that's with Badger Maps, your outside sales team yeah. uh, can generate the same revenue, even though your team is 20% smaller is effectively what we're saying. Right. I don't know. I don't know exactly what the marketing team landed on, but it was some, something like that, but it's, we'll help you do more with less. And, and it's, and I think that in these times, if you haven't changed, if you, if you haven't A-B tested your messaging and you haven't gone back and looked at what is the main message we're bringing to the market, like the most core thing, it's been working for the last four years, we haven't touched it, now is when you should, you should look at that. Because uh, you know, I, I think a lot of companies, I see their messaging being like, we're going to help you shoot for the stars, we're going to help you do better, 
you know, now it's, yeah. we're going to, it's, it's gotta be, we're going to help you keep the wheels on the bus. <laughs> yeah. And, and listen, and now, now is the time. Now is the time to schedule 20 customer interviews and go back and talk to your customers about how their world's changed and uh, send them a massive Grubhub uh, delivery or something as a thank you. <laughs> But, you know, spend time with the customers. Ask them to ha try to solve the problem that they live in today. Grubhub, Lagavulin, yeah. different people have different needs. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I, had, I had someone ask me for, uh, for Lagavulin by name <laughs> this past week. They were doing me a favor. They're like, you should just send me a bottle of Lagavulin. I was like, all right, I, I can do that. <laughs> That's it. Well, they say the golden rule is not to do on the people as you would have them do on to you. It's do unto people as they would have you do unto them. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Well, I'm, I'm going to try to summarize. We've covered a lot of ground today. I'm going to, I'm going to try to summarize it for everybody that's driving in a car while they're listening to this, which is a lot of people. Um, so Vince looks for sales teams that have executives that are looking to go on sales calls and really work alongside the reps to understand how they can be more effective. He thinks that's a great sign and signal. Um, companies, companies need to work to stay competitive. And Vince looks at the current revenue plan and tries to develop an understanding of what the objectives are and where they're going and make sure he sees alignment between, between those two things. He then, works to write a narrative plan that explains the whole go-to-market, the whole revenue plan, which I think is a really unique uh, take on this. It's very, it's very Bezos-y, really, but I, I love it. Um, so, you know, write a plan on what you sell, who you sell it to, why your customers are buying it, who your competitors are, how your customers are, are using the product, how they invest, how, how sales reps invest time, each step of the sales process, what are the goals, um, what are the objections? Everything. Really a, a unique approach here um, that he's used in his consulting engagements to, uh, to, to find the soft spots and weak points in, in, a, in, a re in the revenue plan. Um, major point from Vince, alignment is very important. So make sure that the revenue plan is clear and everyone on the sales team is aligned and working towards these goals. Look for the voice of the customer through feedback and case studies to make sure salespeople are meeting the customer needs and are aligned with them. Also align different teams together. So the lead gen team is working directly with the sales team and that way they stay aligned and, and, and find the best leads for the AEs. Also look for alignment in the, uh, in the comp plan. Scaling is about creating processes that make it easy for new sales teams to get members onboarded. Um, it's also very important to focus on culture as a team scales. We should strive to be servant leaders, uh, meaning as managers, we exist to serve the organization and help it succeed as opposed to the other way around, which is uh, probably a more traditional view of management. To build a great culture, Sales leaders need to create diversity in their team by hiring people from many different backgrounds and perspectives, and that'll strengthen the team and, and the culture. A great comp plan should excite a salesperson and at the same time promotes the values of your company. Um, it's important to have the comp plan not only promote winning new customers, but also focus on keeping the customers that you have and, and, and upselling the customers that you have on, on more business. Finally, it's, it's, it's important to differentiate yourself as a salesperson. Remember, bring value, lead with value first when you're meeting with customers. This has been a fantastic episode, Vince. Uh, where, where can our listeners read more about your work? How do they reach out to you? How can they go deeper with you if, uh, should they be interested in that? Well, that was an amazing recap, by the way. I, I should have, can you send me that? And I'll just that. <laughs> sure. <laughs> This has been the most valuable thing I've ever heard of. Uh, well, They're listen, all your thoughts. I'm just parroting them. Uh, hey, <laughs> great. I hope I believe all this thing tomorrow. No, <laughs> um, no thank, thank you so much. Listen, um, I have a website, vincethompson.co. Vincethompson.co. That's a, 
a good place. My consulting company's middle shift and I send most of my traffic over there. I spend my time, I do, I do uh, several consulting assignments a year. I love to work with uh, executive teams on uh, these issues, either uh, you know reboots, building up, or looking for a little performance enhancement. I uh, live in Los Angeles. I invest in early stage companies where I think I can play a role and usually help them with sales and business development issues. So that's where I'm spending my time lately and what I'm doing. Fantastic. Well, Vince, this has been a great episode of the Outside Sales Talk, and I really appreciate you joining us. Um, if, uh, if anyone listening can think of any other sales reps that would benefit from all the stuff that Vince has talked about today, uh, share the love and forward this on to them. Um, take care until next time, everybody, and thanks for coming, Vince. Thanks so much, Steve. Great.